and welcome back. Before I start with this video, I want to give some context. I have two workshops, so I'm a really lucky guy. And I have the big workshop that you mostly see in the videos with the big machinery and everything, but I have also a smaller workshop at home. And uh, one of the things, one of the first world problems that I have is that um, I use the Shaper Origin a lot and I have one shaper and so I have to bring it with me to the different workshops and sometimes I forget it in one or sometimes I go like oh I think I won't need it so I leave it there and then I go home and then I realize oh crap I need it and it's not here so I've been tossing around the idea of buying a second shaper for a while now and it's obviously expensive um, but it's also annoying, uh, the problem. And so I figured I would gather a little bit of the money I make through the channel and toss in some additional money and just buy a second one. And so that's what I did. I bought myself a second Shaper Origin. And if you think that's decadent, I am with you. This is a first world problem. And obviously one Shaper is more than enough but two is better than one. And so now that I got it, I thought, well, I could just make like an unpacking and getting started video with your shaper, given that it's brand new and I can unpack it and show you how to do that. So if you are in the lucky position of either having just bought your shaper or you're planning to buy one, then this video can maybe help you a little bit. If you already have a shaper, there's no need for you to watch this and just click on to my playlist with other Shaper Origin tips and tricks. All right, let's get started. Let's unpack this baby. This is your new Wonder Machine. Here you have the Shaper, a little tube for the vacuum and some additional gear. I'll take that out of the box and show it to you in a second. Okay, so you see, I took everything out of the box. We have the shaper machine. Then we have this little lid here that you put on your shaper here. You will put that to protect, make sure nothing flies out uh, into your eyes or anything like that. So also, so it's for safety, so you put, don't put your fingers into the running router. We have this little pipe here, this little tube that you attach to your vacuum cleaner. I'll say more about this afterwards. And then you have this little bag here that contains all the useful gear that you need to get started with your shaper. To get started first, you need to remove the two security elements that you have for the trans for transporting the shaper. This is this little thing here, and then there is another one down there. For this, you um, move your spindle up, and then you can remove that. These two things here, I would recommend you store away in the box of the shaper to in the case that you need to transport it, not, not that you move it around in, within your workshop or something like that, but if you have a problem with your shaper, if it's not working, you need to ship it in so they can fix it, then you will need that. And that actually happened to me once. My shaper was broken uh, one time, and so I had to use these to ship it in. So we'll put this away. And then the other thing that you need to do is you need to remove here this little instruction Take it away, and below that you see myself, below, but you also see the screen of the shaper. Within this magic bag here, you have a couple of things, and we can look at them. You have some router bits. You get three of them to start with your shaper, and I'll talk more about this in a second. You have also one of those tools here to open and close the collet that uh, mounts the router bits. 
you have a little USB stick in case that you you put the upload your files to the shaper with uh, a USB stick. You get two of the domino shaper tapes to get started. And you have this little key here to unmount your spindle. That's it, you see that it's empty. Let's start with the router bits. You get different router bits with your shaper origin. Um, in the US, you get different sizes than in Europe. The, you have, first of all, you have a large one, like this one here. That's eight millimeters in Europe and a quarter inch in the US. You get also a small one like this here, which is three millimeters in Europe and an eighth of an inch in the US. And you get a bit to engrave things. Now, I just realized looking at this bit that this one here seems to be different than the one I got when I bought my first shaper. Um, so this looks a lot more like the router bit, the a script bit that I have a video from, from Festool. So it might be that the um, shaper actually realized that the engraving bit they were delivering with a shaper was no good and they changed it for this one. So I'll, I'll have to give it a try here because I I don't know that one. The shaper origin consists of two main elements. You have the shaper, the main shaper station with the computer built in it, the camera and everything. Um, that and, and you have here the spindle. So to unmount the spindle, you have to un screw this um, screw here and then you can just remove it like this. It is attached to your main station with a power plug like that, okay? And so it may be funny to say, but the shaper consists of these two elements. One is smart and one is dumb. So this here is a smart unit. This here is a shaper um, origin with the computer and everything in it. And what it does, it, it controls this element here, this little arm where the spindle is in it, okay? The spindle itself is just a dumb router like every other router you would buy for a couple hundred dollars. Um, it's just an, a router that turns the router bits and that's it. It has an on and off button here and an element to control the speed. That's it. And so by itself, this is really a stupid element because I, it like it just spins if it's turned on or it doesn't spin if it's turned off and that's it. Okay? And all the smartness is in this device here. So to put your router in your collet, you just... Oh, it's a little bit tight here. It seems to be new. Okay. You put it in. Then you have this button here. You press it with your hand, close it, and once it's tight here, then you take this little tool here, and not too tight. Don't go crazy, right, with all these things. Just close it, tighten it until it's tightened, and that's it. That's it. So that's it. Your router bit is mounted, and then you put it back in your shaper and you don't forget to tighten this screw here because only when this is tightened the shaper can control the spindle um, precisely and then obviously you have to plug it in again into your shaper and that's it so we prepared the shaper with a router bed and you can put this little element of protection here it's magnetic so that's really convenient and that's it to turn on your shaper origin you only need to plug it in it has no on off button you just plug it in and it will start booting so you see now it's starting you get the shaper origin logo and it's starting this little operating system that it has because it's like a little computer
So you get first an option to choose the language. I will keep it in English so you can actually um, understand and read uh, what you're seeing here. Normally I would choose German here, but I'll keep it in English. And I need to select the country, which for me is Switzerland. So that's pre-selected. You'll select the, sand, the, the country that you'll need. And now it asks you to connect to a Wi-Fi. So if uh, there's two ways to get um, updates and files onto your Shape Origin, uh, through Wi-Fi or through that little USB stick that you get in this little box when you start. Um, more convenient is obviously Wi-Fi. If you don't have Wi-Fi in your workshop, you can also tether your phone, so that's not a problem. I have Wi-Fi here, so I will select that and I will enter the password of my Wi-Fi, which I'm not going to show you here. So that's it. I entered the password, done, connect, and it will hook up to my Wi-Fi. So now it will ask you to um, either create a Shaper Origin account, Shaper account on Shaper Tools, um, or to log in with yours, okay? It is important that you, you get one of those accounts because that's how you upload the files to your account. So if you have new files, you can upload them, or you can also download files that others did that, um, and that they're providing on the Shaper Hub to use. So there's tons of projects you can look into, you can get instructions and you can just download those files onto your Shaper. So that's all done through this account. And so if you don't have one, you can uh, create one here. Um, I obviously have one, so I will enter mine and then continue. And now it tells me I'm ready to go. Well, right on. That was easy. Next. And that's it. So you see here settings, it's connected to the Wi-Fi. It has my profile. You see what kind of um, operating system it has. You'll get from time to time updates from Shaper. And you can set also here your metric if it's in millimeter or inches. So you use that, you can change it there and that's it. So that's it, and your Shaper is now ready to be used. One of the key elements of the Shaper Origin is the Shaper tape. That's those domino tapes here that you might have seen on videos of people showing how to do things with Shaper Origin. Um, you can buy them directly through Shaper, or you can also print your own a Shaper tape, and I have videos about that too. The Shaper needs those dominoes to orient itself. You need to apply them to your workpiece and then scan the surface so the shaper can learn how your workpiece looks and, and so the shaper knows all the time where exactly and how it's located, okay? And so for this, you need to apply shaper tape to your workpiece, and I did that here. The a recommendation is to leave between each tape about eight centimeters, so it's about three inch. Um, I usually go a little bit narrower than that just because I think it's a pain when it loses orientation. Um, so you see that's what I did here. I just put on a simple board a couple of shaper tapes uh, so you can see how that looks like. When you uh, put your shaper um, on your workpiece and you have the shaper tape there, you see here that we see the shaper tape here. So this is through a camera that the shaper has in there. And so through this camera, you can scan your workpiece, okay? And so we'll do that right now. You see here, we have a little green start scan and a green button. And that is the right-hand side button you have here in your shaper. And cancel here, that's the orange one, you have that on the left-hand side. So if we want to start the scan, we press the green button and it starts scanning. And what you see here, is your workpiece and what the shaper sees. And so you can move the shaper, right? And so you see now it recognizes the end of your workpiece and I move it back and it recognizes the workpiece, okay? You can turn it, but you always have to make, make sure that there is a little bit of those shaper tape visible to the camera, else if you do this, it will tell you orient origin towards already scanned tape because it needs a little bit of tape to know where it is. 
you can turn it, right? And you can do this, right? And so it will take all those pictures, right? So now you see, I don't have the end of that board, but I would like to know how it ends. So I just turn it like this. It loses orientation, but I move it back and now it sees the tape, right? So now I can continue until the end of this board is reached, okay? Okay. Okay, and then when you did all those scanning, then you have here, finish, green button, press the green button, and it will update your workspace. So now what the shaper does, it creates a workspace with that shaper tape and it stores it, okay? And it will, everything you do with your shaper, it will store in your, in that workspace, okay? Um, and so if you, if you route a shape or something, it will know that, it will save it there. And if you move your shaper to a new work piece and do a new scan, right? This old scan is still there, this old workspace. And the shaper will use the camera to scan and realize what work um, space do, are you currently in. And so um, you move it to a new one, you scan it, you have it there, you, move it, you, you put the shaper back on the old one and it will recognize I'm on this old one and it will tell you, should I load this old workspace? So that's super convenient. Okay, so right, we now um, have a workspace, we know it, and what is the next step? We need to either load a shape into your um, shaper through your account, um, or you can create one yourself. So if I do here, press import, so I'll go into table names, and you see here I have different names that I um, create it and sort for engraving into my tables. And so if I want to select this name here, I press the file and it will open this name. And so that's the name. And the next step that you have is you need to select the size. So it has a certain size. That's a size that you created in your vector graphics um, software, but um, you might want to change that. And so you have a couple of options here. You can scale it, you can select the size. We can, for instance, change this here to a height of 50 millimeters. It will keep it, um, the ratio. If you want to change the ratio, you need to uh, press this one. So it, un it, it um, untangles height and width. And so I could now say, for instance, I want 300 width, which would then distort it, right? I don't want that, that looks ugly. So um, I will cancel this here and then import the name again, and that's it. You can also rotate the file by different angles if you want to place it like that or not. And then you can say the anchor. And so anchor is important because the shaper origin basically uses the tip of your router as the point where it places. Uh, the graphic or like the file and so you see here that little square here that's where currently the anchor is and so that's on the bottom you can also say I want to center it and then it's like that okay and so you will have to play around a little bit to make sure you place um, the your shape your file on the on the right position the moment you think the file is on the right place you can press then this green button place and it will place this I will not do this right now. I'll cancel this with the orange button uh, because I want to show you the other options. You have a, a create button and you have a grid button. So the grid one is to create a grid that you can use to orient the shapes exactly on like a square grid or something. Um, I will not show you how to use that. There's videos. There's a video from Shaper uh, from the company showing you how to do that. And so uh, I think that is something that you can use as a, a second uh, step. If you get started with your shaper, then you can stay more simple and just place 
an object. And so the other option you have, you can create things um, depending uh, in, in your shaper without a computer, you can create circles or rectangles. You can write things or you have a pen tool you see, and you have a little tool to create box joints. Um, I will only basically use a simple circle. You can use a diameter here. And so I will say 10 centimeters. And so you see here, we have this circle and I can go somewhere and I can place it. So you see, when I move now the shaper, then I get um, to see the tape here in the, in the upper part. So I know where I am, right? Um, and I'll place it just here. All right, if you have that, then you have already one design element here, which is that simple circle. Right. And if I want to cut that circle now, I need to go to cut. And in cut, you will have a couple of uh, important elements. Here on the left-hand side, uh, you see um, this is the cut depth. So it's set to five millimeters. I will uh, set that now to less. You can say engrave, that's when you um, are engraving something. And uh, so you want it to be very, very thin. And then you can set diff different depth. And you can say air cut, air cut means it doesn't really cut, it's just to try it out, right? So how deep uh, should you go? The recommendation is that you should never go deeper than the width of your router bed. So if you, for instance, you use a, an eighth of an inch router bed, then you should not cut deeper in one pass than an eighth of an inch. You can cut an eighth of an inch, and then when it's cut, you can set it to a quarter of an inch and cut again, right? So you take it in multiple passes because the deeper you go, the more uh, the pressure on your router, on your shaper, on the material, and things can happen, right? It can just go in the wrong direction and you will cut in the wrong, it will just all screw, be screwed up. You don't want that. In general, I recommend to take multiple passes. If you're not in a rush, which I hope you're not, because you should enjoy that, you should not uh, try to rush things, then take small cuts. I, I typically go around two to three millimeters per pass. The, um, uh, this here is a button for an offset, so that's when you uh, want to offset. The, you don't want to cut on the line that you set, but maybe one millimeter um, next to it. So you can, you can set that on this here. And here you need to select the router bit, right? And so this is the uh, European machine, and my router bit is eight millimeters, so I can just select eight. And if I do that, then the shaper Say, uh, realizes, oh, there's a new bit in there, and now it needs to learn how you mounted that bit. Because when you put the bit in it, it's different heights, right? Depending on how, where you screwed it in, it will be in a different location. And so the shaper needs to learn um, what the distance is between the spindle, the, router, the, the, the tip of the router bit, and your workpiece. And you do that through this Z touch. And it asks you, do you want to do a Z touch? You say yes. And now you see it will move down and it will learn where it is. And so that's it. Now it learned where your router bit is. And then once you have that, you're ready to cut, right? If I want to cut now and I press on the green button cut, it will not cut because it says cannot start cutting when the spindle is off. Turn the spindle on and try again. So why is that? It's because I did explain to you like the spindle is stupid, right? The spindle is not connected to the shaper and starts turning when you want to cut. You actually need to turn on your spindle through the button that you have here. And so let me show to you that button. Here you have the button on off. And if I turn this on, then the spindle will start spinning. So this will be really loud and won't be able to speak to you. So I will turn it on. So only when you have um, your spindle turned on, you'll be able to cut something. So these are separate things. Turn on the spindle and then start cutting. One important element to understand on your shaper is this little circle that you have here. The circle shows you the area 
that the shaper can use to correct the spindle. Because you will obviously, when you um, move along the circle, you will never do that perfectly. You're just a human being, right? So you will turn it more and onto the left, more onto the right, right? And the shaper knows exactly where the spindle is and can course correct for this. And that's how you get the nice shape. And so within this circle, um, that's the wiggle room that the shaper has. If you move it completely to the front, like it won't be able to correct for that because it's too much of a distance that you created and it will it will um, move up the spindle uh, because it will realize if I continue along that way, I will ruin your workpiece. But to be honest, like if you do it too quick, it won't be um, moving it up in time and you will actually ruin your workpiece. So obviously you need to try to stay within that circle uh, for it to work. When you use your shaper, use both hands on the shaper origin, you turn it on, then you lower it into where you want to cut and you start moving it in the direction. And you see here on this circle that this little line is moving in a direction. So that's the direction the shaper wants you to move. You're not free to move in any direction except if you're doing a pocket cut. But if you're doing a line cut like this one here, you have to move in that direction. So you move in that direction slowly but steady and you try to keep it always on that line okay always on that line uh, to make sure um, you're not moving too far off and it needs to and the shaper needs to move up the spindle okay so that's it and then you move it you always make sure it sees enough tape right i cannot suddenly start to turn it like that because now you see it shows you here on the on this um, little domino symbol here that it does not see enough shaper tape. And if it doesn't see the t shaper tape, it doesn't know where it is. And so it will stop working. It will move up the spindle and tell you, go to a place where I see a domino tape. Okay, so I move it back. It sees it again. And right, so when I cut here this circle, I will have to cut like that, right? Always keep the camera facing to the domino tape. And so let's get that done. I'll cut this circle here quickly to uh, do an illustration only one millimeter deep. Um, and I'll hook up the, vac the vacuum so it can prevent my workshop from getting dusty. And I'll do this and then we can continue speaking. That was it that was the first cut with my new shaper origin isn't that exciting and so let's check how that turns out it turned out it's obviously just a simple circle did it work out oh yes it did let me show that to you that's it fantastic sir that's mostly it that's that's how you start to go about it now whatever what i would recommend to you is that you take a little board nothing important you put shaper tape on it and then you put a couple of um, like circle squares, maybe something written, a couple of files you try out. Nothing, I mean, don't work immediately on the thing that you want to create because you will it will get you a while to get accustomed to the machinery, to how the software works, to the different bit sizes, all these things. Um, so you just go about that, try it, try it out, and then you move on once you have a little bit more of experience. One more thing, before I uh, told you that you have this little tube here. Actually, you know what the right word is in English? Is it tube or is it pipe? I, I don't know. Well, you have this little thing here that you use to connect it to your vacuum cleaner um, for the dust collection, right? And so funny thing is that if you have a Festool uh, vac vacuum, then you can plug that in directly into the Shaper Origins uh, vacuum um, dust, dust collection system because this is, the Shaper Origin is actually, Shaper belongs to Festool now. And so that's the right size. This here you might need if you have an other dust collector. 
So I don't need that. So you make sure you check it out if you really need it or not, because like this is, this is embarrassing to say, but for a while I always used this because I never realized I could, I could plug it in directly until one day I realized that and I was like, oh, additional work step for nothing. So um, this I don't need in my workshop for now. Okay, that's it. That was the unpacking and getting started video uh, with the shape origin. I think that's it for now. What I will do is in uh, a couple of weeks, I'll post a video um, summarizing all the additional gear that I think that you should buy to get started. I mean, I have a bunch of videos showing different router beds and different elements, right? And so I'll uh, put all of that together and do like a roundup, like a summary video of um, what additional gear that you might benefit from based on my experience. Uh, and so stay tuned about that. I hope you liked this little video, and if you did, thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and see you around.